he is from one third to twice as large, has longer legs in proportion to his size, and has the most preposterous ears that ever were mounted on any creature but a jackass. When he is sitting quiet, thinking about his sins, or is absent-minded or unapprehensive of danger, his majestic ears project above him conspicuously, but the breaking of a twig will scare him nearly to death, and then he tilts his ears back gently and starts for home. All you can see then for the next minute is his long gray form stretched out straight and streaking it through the low sagebrush, head erect, eyes right, and ears just canted a little to the rear, but showing you where the animal is all the time, the same as he carried a jib, the same as if he carried a jib. Now and then he makes a marvelous spring with his long legs, high over the stunted sagebrush, and scores a leap that would make a horse envious. Presently he comes down to a long, graceful lope, and shortly he mysteriously disappears. He is crouched behind a sagebrush and will sit there and listen and tremble until you get within six feet of him when he will get underway again. But one must shoot at this creature once if he wishes to see him throw his heart, his heart into his heels and do the best he knows how. He is frightened clear through now and he lays his long ears down on his back, straightens himself out like a yardstick. Every spring he makes and scatters miles behind him with an easy indifference that is enchanting. Our party made this specimen hump himself, as the conductor said. The secretary started him with a shot from the colt. I commenced spitting at him with my weapon, and at the same instant the old Allen's whole broadside let go with a rattling crash, and it is not putting it too strong to say that that rabbit was frantic. He dropped his ears, set up his tail, and left for San Francisco at a speed which can only be described as a flash and a vanish. Long after he was out of sight, we could hear him whiz. I do not remember where we first came across sagebrush, but as I have been speaking of it, I may as well describe it. This is easily done, for if the reader can imagine a gnarled and venerable live oak tree reduced to a little shrub, two feet high with its rough bark, its foliage, its twisted bows, boughs, all complete. He can picture the sagebrush exactly. Often on lazy afternoons in the mountains, I have lain on the ground with my face under a sagebrush and entertained myself with fancying that the gnats among its foliage were Lilliputian birds and that the ants marching and counter-marching about its base were Lilliputian flocks and herds and myself some vast loafer from, from Brobdignag waiting to catch a little citizen and eat him. It is an imposing monarch of the forest in exquisite miniature, is the sagebrush. Its foliage, foliage is a grayish green and gives that tint to desert and mountain. It smells like our domestic sage and sage tea made from from it tastes like the sage tea which all boys are so well acquainted with. The sagebrush is a singularly hardy plant and grows right in the midst of deep sand and among barren rocks where nothing else in the vegetable world would try to grow except bunch grass. Bunch grass grows on the bleak mountainsides in Nevada and neighboring territories and offers excellent feed for stock even in the dead of winter wherever the snow is blown aside and exposes it. Notwithstanding its unpromising home, bunch grass is a better and more nutritious diet for cattle and horses than almost any other hay or grass that is known, so Stockman said. The sagebrushes grow from three to six or seven feet apart all over the mountains and deserts of the far west, clear to the borders of California. There is not a tree or of any kind in the deserts for hundreds of miles, there is no vegetation at all in a regular desert except the sagebrush and its cousin, the greasewood, which is so much like the sagebrush that the difference amounts to little. Campfires and hot suppers in the deserts would be impossible but for the friendly sagebrush. Its trunk is as large as a boy's wrist, and from that up to a man's arm, and its crooked branches are half as large as, as its trunk, all good sound hard wood. 
very like oak. is to cut sagebrush and in a few minutes there is an opulent pile of it ready for use. A hole a foot wide, two feet deep, and two feet long is dug and sagebrush chopped up and burned in it till it is full to the brim with glowing coals. Then the cooking begins and there is no smoke and consequently no swearing. Such a fire will keep up all night with very little replenishing and it makes a very sociable campfire and, and one around which the most impossible reminiscences, reminiscences sound plausible, instructive, and profoundly entertaining. Sagebrush is very fair fuel, but as a vegetable it is a distinguished failure. Nothing can abide the taste of it but the jackass and his illegitimate child the mule. But their testimony to its nutritiousness is worth noting, is worth nothing, for they will eat pine knots or anthracite coal or bra brass fillings or lead pipe or old bottles or anything that comes handy and then go off looking as grateful as if they had had oysters for dinner. Mules and donkeys and camels have appetites that anything will relieve temporarily and nothing satisfy. In Syria once, at the headwaters of the Jordan, a camel took charge of my overcoat while the tents were being pitched and examined it with a critical eye all over with as much interest as if he had an idea of getting one made like it. And then, after he was done figuring on it as an article of, app of apparel, he began to contemplate it as an article of diet. He put his foot on it and lifted one of the sleeves out with his teeth and chewed and chewed at it, gradually taking it in, and all the while opening and closing his eyes in a kind of religious ecstasy, as if he had never tasted anything as good as an overcoat before in his life. Then he smacked his lips once or twice and reached after the other sleeve. Next he tried the velvet collar and smiled a smile of such contentment that it was plain to see that he regarded that as the daintiest thing about an overcoat. The tails went next, along with some percussion caps and cough candy and some fig paste from Constantinople. And then my newspaper correspondence dropped out, and he took a chance in that. Manuscript letters written for the home paper. And he was treading on dangerous ground now. He began to come across solid wisdom, wisdom in those documents that was rather weighty on his stomach. And occasionally he would take a joke that would shake him up till it loosened his teeth. It was getting to the perilous times with him, getting to be perilous times with him, and he, but he held his grip with good courage, and hopefully, till at last he began to stumble on statements that not even a camel could swallow with impunity. He began to gag and gasp, and his eyes to stand up, and his forelegs to spread, and in about a quarter of a minute he fell over as stiff as a carpenter's workbench, and died a death of indescribable agony. I went and pulled the manuscript out of his mouth and found that the sensitive creature had choked to death on one of the mildest and gentlest statements of fact that I ever laid before a trusting public. I was about to say, when diverted from my subject, that occasionally one finds sage bushes five or six feet high and with a spread of branch and foliage in proportion, but two or two and a half feet is the usual height. Chapter 4, Making Our Bed, Assaults by the Unabridged, at a Station, Our Driver a Great and Shining Dignitary. Strange Place for a Front Yard, Accommodations, Double Portraits, An Heirloom, Our Worthy Landlord, Fixings and Things, An Exile, Slum Gullion, A Well-Furnished Table, The Landlord Astonished, Table etiquette, wild Mexican mules, stage coaching and railroading. As the sun went down and the evening chill came on, we made preparation for bed. We stirred up the hard leather, leather le letter sacks and the knotty canvas bags of printed matter, knotty and uneven because of projecting ends and corners of magazines, boxes, and books. 
We stirred them up and redisposed them in such a way as to make our bed as level as possible. And we did improve it too, though after all our work it had an upheaved and billowy look about it, like a little piece of a stormy sea. Next we hunted up our boots from old from odd nooks among the mail bags where they had settled and put them on. Then we got down our coats, vests, pantaloons, and heavy woolen shirts from the arm loops where they had been swinging all day and clothed ourselves in them. For there being no ladies either in the stations or in the coach and the weather being hot, we had looked to our comfort by stripping to our underclothing at nine o'clock in the morning. All things being now ready, we stowed the uneasy dictionary where it would lie as quiet as possible and placed the water canteens and pistols where we could find them in the dark. Then we smoked a final pipe and swapped a final yarn after which we put the pipes, tobacco, and bag of coin in snug holes and caves among the mail bags and then fastened down the coach curtains all around and made the place as dark as the inside of a cow, as the conductor phrased it in his picturesque way. It was certainly as dark as any place could be. Nothing was even dis dimly visible in it. And finally we rolled ourselves up like silkworms, each person in his own blanket, and sank peacefully to sleep. Whenever the stage stopped to change horses, we would wake up and try to recollect where we were and succeed, and in a minute or two the stage would be off again, and we likewise. We began to get into a country now th threaded here and there with little streams. These had high steep banks on each side, and every time we flew down one bank and scrambled up the other, our party inside got mixed somewhat. First we, we would all be down in a pile at the forward end of the stage, kneeling in a sitting posture, and in a second we would shoot to the other end and stand on our heads and we would sprawl and kick too and ward off ends and corners of mail bags that came lumbering over us and about us and as the dust rose from the tumult we would all sneeze in chorus and the majority of us would grumble and probably say some hasty thing like take your elbow out of my ribs can't you quit crowding every time we avalanched from one end of the stage to the other the unabridged dictionary would come to and every time it came it damaged somebody one trip it barked the secretary's elbow the next trip it hurt me in the stomach and the third it tilted bemis's nose up till he could look down his nostrils he said the pistols and coins soon settled at the to the bottom but the pipes, pipe stems, tobacco, and canteens clattered and floundered after the dictionary every time it made an assault on us and aided and abetted the book by spilling tobacco in our eyes and water down our backs. Still, all things considered, it was a very comfortable night. It wore gradually away, and when at last a cold gray light was visible through the puckers and chinks in the curtains, we yawned and stretched with satisfaction. Shed our cocoons, and felt that we had slept as much as was necessary. By and by, 